Last year I went netting in this area where there were virtually no ground fish and no cod. I averaged about, for the whole season, averaged 10,000 pounds a day. The productivity of this half of the Gulf of Maine is tremendous if given a, a, a chance. We didn't give it. We simply ground it into what it is today. But we have learned, because if we do, we have something that will last for generations again. So we're at the Nequasset Fish Ladder in Woolwich, and it's on Nequasset Stream. And at the head of the stream is a reservoir, and that is drinking water supply for Bath and several other communities around here. And the reason that there is a dam at this location is to regulate the amount of water that is held in the reservoir. At this site, since the 1600s, there has been required legislated passage over any barrier that was located here so that fish could pass over the barrier. But how is fish passage at the Nequasset Dam in Woolwich connected to cod fishery restoration in Maine? The Nequasset Dam is located on a tributary of the Kennebec River. The Androscoggin, Penobscot, and St. Croix are also among Maine's major rivers. Maine has more than 500 dams, many of which do not allow for fish passage. We had a speaker from Bowdoin College, John Lichter, came to speak about ecological recovery in the Kennebec River, specifically restoring the base of the food chain, restoring these migratory fish, the river herring, to the system so that then they could return to the sea and be a food source for the ground fish in the Gulf of Maine. The superintendent of the Bath Water District heard the lecture, understood with much greater um, comprehension the importance of alewives. And he said, wow, I, I have an alewife problem. I own a dam. It has a fish ladder. The fish ladder is falling apart. I understand now the importance of getting those fish over my dam. And he walked basically across the street to the land trust office and said, let's work together and figure this out. Nequasset is one of many projects to restore migratory fish populations by improving fish passage over dams. Another success story is the new fish lift at the Benton Falls Dam, located on the Sebastocook River near Waterville, Maine. And so the hopper just picked up about 1,500 fish and now it's going to head back to the top and come out. Benton Falls and Nequasset are part of a larger restoration effort. In 2010, as a scholar-in-residence at Bowdoin College, Ted Ames, a retired fisherman, found the connection between Maine's river systems and coastal fisheries. You look in Maine today and you've got lobster fishing. 
the whole concept of single species uh, management of the whole Gulf of Maine just doesn't work. Uh, the end result is, is we've depleted one fishery after another. River systems played a critical role, particularly in northern Gulf of Maine, by providing uh, a large and vibrant prey base for piscivores, for predator species of fish, like cod and haddock and pollock and so on. This uh, prey base was diminished tremendously by the construction of dams on all of New England's rivers. And uh, the end result was uh, a sharp decline in the number of alewives uh, entering the system each year. It's just much more than a fish story. This ladder, all this money, all these people is not just for the alewife. The alewife feeds so many different species. The contribution that we're making through this one small stream to restoring the ground fishery in the Gulf of Maine, I love thinking of that. This is a community-based restoration project. It just takes some personal initiative to realize that there's something that I can improve here. And you get a few people together and they all realize that they have an opportunity for common benefit and you figure out a solution. The stories that come to people as they visit this site, the history that they have within their own family, that's beyond just the fish. surroundings here really define how we live our lives, um, how we relate to each other. There's energy, there's a pulse, you know, it's almost like being in a big city or the stock market, you know, you're reeling, you're dealing, you're, things are moving. These wild Alaskan salmon, or maybe they're wild Canadian salmon, you know, and they're feeding the world. Southeast Alaska's fishery is over a billion dollars. Tourism is over a billion dollars in industry. I can't think of much money that I've made in my life that wasn't because of fit. Four words, man. Humpies pay the bills. Huge, huge, huge. I mean, it, it doesn't get any bigger. This, this is it. It's like the farmer depends on rain for his crops, you know. It's, we depend on our environment for these fisheries that we're all involved in. Yes, that's British Columbia, and yes, this is Alaska, but as far as the fish and the nature and the essence of the river, there's no line there. But the bulk of these fish are coming back to these three big transboundary rivers, the Takustakin and the Eunuch. And if you see impacts to the fish in there, those impacts are going to cascade across southeast Alaska through the different economic sectors. No matter where you fish in southeast Alaska, you're probably at risk from some of the effects of these mines. All this mining, proposed mines, are taking place across the border in Canada, so we're not going to see any kind of economic benefit. 
The only thing we're going to see in this region is the environmental risks. I mean, when I became aware of the scale the mines proposed, The tailings dams up there are going to have to contain several billion tons of acid generating rock. Uh, that stuff has to be kept out of the waters forever. Forever is a hell of a long time. I haven't seen data that convinces me that we have that capability in, in those kind of rugged places. And I'm not even entirely convinced that that's their highest goal. There has been a lot of deregulation for environmental protection in Canada and in BC with the very transparent agenda of pushing through as many new mines through as possible. You know, when our people asked about the tailings and whether they were safe, and the answer was always the same. It's the exact same structure as Mount Pauly. And it's safe, it's perfectly safe. It's perfectly safe. The area is really, really lush. Lots of clean water and lots of cedar trees and it's this really special place. And this happened right before the salmon were coming. Maybe the worst environmental disaster in British Columbia's history. Ten of wastewater containing dangerous chemicals poured into local waterways when the earthen dam surrounding a tailings pond collapsed. The technologies, the experts, everybody was on deck when they built Mount Polly Mine as the shining example of new mining in British Columbia. And it failed in less than 20 years. This disaster, what happened out in Quinell Lake, that's our children's inheritance. This is what we're leaving them. Is there any sense of how much cost it would be to put the dam back and what, what kind of insurance coverage do you have? Um. Seeing is believing, yep. But try it on a scale seven times bigger tribes, commercial and sport fishermen, subsistence fishermen, uh, a lot of the local governments. Right now you've got almost all sectors of Southeast in agreement that these BC mines are a threat to our interest over here. There's not enough controls on them and we want more engagement from the state of Alaska and the U.S. feds. What would you say to Secretary Kerry? I would say that, you know, he has a responsibility to protect probably the last pristine piece of the United States and do with everything he has. There's a widespread problem in our rivers. Fish populations are in decline. Here in Connecticut, there are over 4,000 dams that prevent migratory fish from reaching important spawning habitat. Half of these dams are in streams that feed the Connecticut River, like this one. My name is Sally Harold. I'm Director of River Restoration and Fish Passage for the Connecticut Chapter of the Nature Conservancy. <laughs> Most dams are privately owned. 
In order to rebuild these fish stocks, the Nature Conservancy works with dam owners to build fishways and remove dams. Our success depends on building strong relationships with dam owners. I'm Larry Timmerman, and this is my dam. I think anything we can do to restore you know, the, the uh, natural migration patterns of these fish is well worthwhile. The Nature Conservancy has been very good to work with. We'll create a bunch of watery steps, basically. It's called a pool and weir fishway, and that will enable those uh, spawning fish when they return next spring to make it up into the head pond and the stream up above, at least to the next dam. I'm fortunate that I've been able to fish in a lot of different areas. It's a good feeling to come back to a place where people do pay attention to things that we do work to get the streams back in the condition they were beforehand. Most people, when they think of a stingray, they probably think of a, an ocean fish. What most people probably don't realize is that three of the largest freshwater fish in the world are stingrays. Like this fish, it's a giant freshwater stingray. A stingray in freshwater that reportedly grows up to a thousand pounds. No one's really done any research on these big rays. Their distribution is unclear. Their life history is unclear. For me, it was a mystery. I wanted to learn more. I wanted to learn more about where these ray, rays occur, how big they get, learn about their biology. But I was surprised to hear that people were fishing for giant freshwater stingray in these rivers in central Thailand. And so I thought if I could work with local fishermen and recreational anglers who were out here fishing fairly regularly, it might be possible to start getting some of this information about these big rays. It's taken me 10 years to start answering some of these questions about the basic biology of giant freshwater stingray. Trying to understand how many rays are in the stretch of river, how fast they grow, which also uh, indicates how vulnerable they are to overfishing, uh, their movement patterns, are they moving out into the ocean, do they need to, to migrate in order to complete their life cycle. I'm curious how big they get. I want to know if they are the world's largest freshwater fish. And I think that there are probably record-breaking fish within a mile of where we're sitting right now. We are near Raymond, Washington, overlooking Willapa Bay. At low tide, oyster beds stretch as far as you can see. This is prime estuary habitat for juvenile salmon, especially chum who carry out part of their life cycle in these waters. 
After emerging from their eggs, the tiny salmon migrate down to the estuary, linger for several months before heading out to sea. Some salmon go beyond the estuary, migrating up and down the coast, venturing into other creeks with estuary habitat. These coastal estuaries are salmon nurseries. Here at Shepkaiden Creek, this dike and tide gate have blocked salmon for at least 50 years from 60 acres of estuary and over three miles of stream habitat behind the dike. When the landowners realized they had a fish barrier on their property, they applied to the Family Forest Fish Passage Program to have the dike and tide gate removed and a bridge installed further upstream to access their forest land. Now that the dike is gone, saltwater flows into this estuary, carrying the juvenile chum salmon into the abundant wetlands with ample food and cover. Coho and sea-run cutthroat trout can migrate upstream to spawning grounds, lay their eggs, and start a new run of salmon. The Omaha family has shown how small forest landowners can manage their forests, restore a natural life cycle, and help increase fish production on their property. Thank <laughs> you. 
This is an owl wife, kids. You put him in the river so he doesn't have to go back in the... There he goes. There's the first one. We're here restoring an owl wife run. It was a historic run here that was extirpated due to poor passage at a road crossing. We put 500 adult river herring, owl wives and blueback herring out today. Of the 500, 250 a male, 250 a female. Of which 30,000 eggs a female times 250, they say it's a lot of fish. There's a lot of fish passage issues in places that used to have owl wife runs, and there's a bunch of places where the community is working on fixing that, but it just takes so much time. Okay, kids, go to work. Go to work. For the next four years, we'll stock the pond, and we'll, that, there's a four-year life cycle, so in four years, the progeny of these fish should return here, and given passage, they'll have a continuing run here. The seagulls aren't even here, and the lobstermen are in wanting bait already, for God's sake. An owl wife's role in life is to get eaten, and they spend their whole life trying not to get eaten. Everything eats them. Um, we see the eagle population, the osprey population of the main stem Kennebec since we started this restoration project has absolutely exploded. Because we've got some osprey up here. Oh, they'll, they'll love these things. The adults will stay in the pond for approximately two weeks while they spawn, and then they will leave and return to the ocean. Uh, the juveniles should hang out in the pond until September or October and they will migrate out to the ocean before the ice comes in and four years later they'll come back. They're, they're tough and fragile at the same time. It's amazing where you find them, where they return to. We have some places that we've started restoration at and you look at the stream and you'd never imagine that you're just, yeah, they're never going to make it back up through here. They're not going to make it over that falls. And four years later, you go down below the dam and there's, there they are. It's, it's definitely amazing. Last one. Yeah. That's the last one. Yeah. <laughs> Good luck, fish. Salmon in the Northwest are, are really, you know, part of the fabric of our society. These are fish that carry more importance than their weight as meat. Salmon runs in Washington State are declining because much of their habitat, like these small forest streams, are blocked by these seemingly insignificant culverts. Many people don't realize how important these small streams are to salmon and trout. A fish passage barrier is uh, often a culvert, but it can be any man-made structure that either fully or partially blocks fish passage during certain times of the year. The Family Forest Fish Passage Program was created by the legislature in 2003, and this was in response to the fact that small forest landowners are required to fix their fish barriers on their property. This is a program that is designed to improve fish passage and uh, reduce maintenance concerns for private citizens. For the mom and pops, when you're asking them to put in a $120,000 bridge, it's a problem. So this program was created to help alleviate that financial burden. 
This is a statewide program. They get a new bridge or a culvert. It gets money into the local communities, helps the fish. We call it 3F2P. We were asked if we'd like to come to a seminar, and we went down there and I saw this little brochure, you know, and I just got looking into it and I thought, you know, this is great. This is what we need. We have a, a barrier in our creek, and I, I'm going to need to do something before too long about that. Well, I guess I understood was that there was money available for a project like this, and uh, I knew if this goes through, it was going to be a great asset to this piece of property. The process typically comes in the form of a landowner making contact with us. The entire thing's engineered, and we do it all for them. So it's a very simple from the landowner's perspective. When we first meet these landowners and we're discussing the program with them, uh, they do seem a little skeptical. It really is as good a deal as it sounds. You know, it's the practicality of it. And your landowner is like, uh, we've only got a limited amount of resources here. We're not a super big company. We're not somebody with deep pockets. You know, we've got kids in college. We pay our own medical insurance. And we could never put a bridge in like this. But before we even signed up, I want to know that there were no strings attached. There are no tricks here. There are no hidden costs. There are no hidden commitments. They came and gave me the straight skinny on this thing right from the beginning, and uh, it's just, everything has just been right. DNR is really helpful, you know, and uh, they'll help you through every, every step of the way. If you have questions, they'll answer the questions. Well, I would advise anybody to uh, take advantage of a program like this. Triple F is a, is a great example of, I think, a, a super partnership between private citizens who stand to benefit from the program, local nonprofits like Wild Fish Conservancy, and several state agencies that are involved in the program. It's, it's a rare, I think, example of uh, a very effective partnership among a diverse group of interests. After we received funding, and the bridge goes in, and, um, you know, Basically, it's up to us to keep the bridge open. You know, we can send out a, a fully loaded log truck, which, you know, you could have 105,000 pounds going across this thing and you're just fine. This bridge means a lot to me because for years I've kept the old culvert open and of course my kids or whoever owns this is gonna be using this for forever. I encourage people to to take a serious look at their property, to see what are the things that they can do to enhance its value for the, for the public and for themselves. The program really is a no-brainer. There's no downsides to it. It's a win for the landowner, it's a win for the people of Washington, and most importantly, it's a win for the environment. With a minimal investment, fish passage projects really, I think, give us one of the biggest bangs for our buck. Anybody that was skeptical and, and might think this is uh, going to turn into a bureaucratic nightmare will find out just the opposite. It's really uh, been a breeze to, to go through this whole thing. And doing the right thing is important, and uh, this is definitely the right thing. This project on Goliath Creek fulfilled Mr. Baker's requirement to correct his barrier culvert. And salmon now have access to over four miles of stream habitat. That little creek in your backyard could be fantastic salmon habitat. By reopening up access to miles of habitat above these barriers, then we've inherently uh, and undeniably increased the production potential for that watershed. The Department of Fish and Wildlife just places a very high priority on restoring habitat for salmon. I know that what I'm doing here is going to affect salmon for hundreds of years, and it's, uh, it's very satisfying. We've never had fish in it before, so now I realize that, you know, there can be fish in here and there will be fish. There are little fish now, you know, and this, this was possible through all the cooperation of all the different agencies that stepped up at each step of the way, and uh, every one of them was just tremendous to work with. It was a wonderful process. I have nothing but good things to say. Don't be afraid, do it.
soft round egg rests in a nest of river stones. Who would care for the egg and baby when she hatched? I will, said frog. I will, said rabbit. I'll take care of the tiny egg hiding in the river stone, said the beaver. The tiny egg wiggled, twitched, and squirmed. Not a frog, not a rabbit, no beaver to be sure. A tiny fish hatched from the egg and swam up from the river stones. Now who will care for the baby fish and its river home? We will, said the girls. We will, said the boys. Kids don't have very far to walk from Martha Mary Daycare to their stream here in this remnant woodland shaded by tall trees in Centennial Park here in Palsbo. The coho and cutthroat trout that live here have a much longer journey from Liberty Bay up the South Fork of Dogfish Creek to this small section of this stream where the adults can find adequate, healthy spawning gravel. Growing number of buildings, roads, parking lots means more and more oil, silt, and other pollutants washing into the stream. Here on the South Fork of Dogfish Creek, fish have found habitat to survive. Nearby, Palsbo Creek hasn't thrived. I didn't catch anything, huh? Okay. Bad luck. Well, we learned something, though, huh? What did we learn? Not to go fishing here. Good habitat means lots of trees, wide buffer, lots of shrubs, other plants. It also means riffles and deep pools good cover and a lack of barriers to up and downstream movement. Even on the South Fork of Dogfish Creek, some culverts can be a problem for fish and sediment passage. This is a good example where my dog and I used to be able to walk through this culvert. Much of Paulsville Creek flows through culverts and other underground pipes and where it does flow above ground, very little natural vegetation remains and it's these kinds of habitat changes that have essentially eliminated fish life. One day we tried to see if sticks would float through the long pipe where Paulsbo Creek flows under Lyons Park just before it plunges into Liberty Bay. The sticks didn't make it through the pipe. At the mouth of Paulsbo Creek, where the stream traces a path across the beach at low tide, we hope to show Elsa a good place to go fishing. Oh, we just got a whole bunch. This one has only one stripe. And it's green on it, too. Look at this one. This is a fluffy sculpin. Come here, Fluffy. Fluffy. Elsa, <laughs> look. This is a seahorse cousin called a pipefish. Yeah, it this looks like a pipe. <laughs> what will these children's children discover when they venture out to see what mysteries are hidden in the creek? The future of these urban watersheds is up to all of us. We will sprinkle seeds by Rabbit's Meadow, down by Frog's favorite pond, and the, the kids have already done this, oh. where our pup plays with beaver sticks. When beaver chomps, we'll plant some trees and watch them grow so beaver can chomp some more. <laughs> to build a dam, a beaver pond, and a home for baby fish safe from hungry eyes. Oh, that's really cute. you see the salmon jumping waterfalls, you would think, geez, they can get over some small concrete. This thousand feet, there are no places to rest, so the fish don't have a chance to make it up here. The concrete was put in the 70s and 80s. There's cracks downstream. Big panels of concrete are breaking up. We determined that just putting the concrete wouldn't be a good idea. We could put in these series of pools and riffles 
that would allow the fish to have those resting spots and move through the steep section of the river to have access upstream. The fish that come out of Lake Michigan, they need to move upstream. They need to find places where they can actually reproduce. That's not going to happen in a concrete line channel. It's not going to happen in this faster moving larger water down at the bottom of the stream. They've engineered this so that northern pike can pass through. Northern pike are sort of the weakest swimmer. So if a northern pike can pass through, everything else can pass through. Walleye, uh, salmonage, trout, sturgeon, things like that that everybody cares about. So this isn't a project that just benefits trout and salmon. It's a project that benefits everybody who likes to fish for anything that moves up out of Lake Michigan. The, the buzz for us is that, you know, especially our members that live in places like Wauwatosa and places like Menominee Falls, they're looking at this and they're saying, hey, I'm going to be able to fish in that park, that publicly accessible area right in my own backyard, and I'm going to be able to catch salmon and trout right there. Absolutely excited about it. This was the key. This is the linchpin. If the fish can get through here, that opens up all of those other access points. There's about 37 miles of streams that will be accessed. About 20 miles of the Menominee River up to Menominee Falls will be accessible by salmon, trout, uh, walleyes, and smallmouth bass. It's absolutely exciting. Yaguna, 
chibi mi aicha wasi kamunisha ya chinalyara yari hakanchi nyukanchi yaupa punda kailaktara apamu nyukanchi ya yaunara chi tayarisha andia misi kamunisha yarisha atun raimira rasha nyukanchi andia warmira akhya hakanchi andia warmira choranoka raina tokungwa handia wadi mbaila konaka andia wa chiraigo rakuna mai aicha wa yapa taka chewara Hali nukanchi kai kuna shayauchi kai ni kisawali yako mayani itena mayala mana yapa karo niapa nukanchi kau 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 uras kai mayu fumak mayu hata manara sukta wata washa ma manara kai at kai yaku yara undas kai tu kui kau hakanchi kai ni aska wasiona aska runa Kai yaku gusto armauska, kere kai paktaisha, aska aichawara hapiuska. Ari nyu kai chile aska ya aska ra sen tisa rikpani kai kai yakura, kai yakui aska aichawara aska ra rikoshi nyu kai sen tika nyu ya palya inyasha inyasha risha nyu ka kai aichawonara, apisha aichaya yeto koshani. Ya pisha nyoka warmi nyoka wawona nikunara chaishani kai mayupi aicha wawona tiang kandia chaliwa sardina ninchi chiya aicha wawona imanchi shikito chinalyara tiang una rimashun shu aicha wawona mahi chiya wawona chimanda chamunun kai ichile yakunam sekasha sekamunun aska Pai samus kai, pai tas kai as kai samus. Cita nyu kan ci ari kusa, kas na sami ang solo na ri curasa a pinc. Kai ai cawasi kamus kai nyu kan ci ai cawasa mi kusa, gustura mi kunc. Sumak mi kuna mi kang nyu kan ci, ya yak tamanda mi kuna ra ap mus kamanda mas iyali. Kai yaku as kara ministis as kara servis kai nyu kan ci kai yaku armangga, opingga. Ya capar tak sangka, sendara tu koras ya kucas kan juga sih, askar servis. Di kuni jepi ya ku Marisha, aicha wasa pamusha, hat pun ada orang. Karter elas ke? Ini masih elas ke? Ini kan jadi tormenta ni kan cuma, kau nak angsa karter awak nak fakta musuh, na ada nai cium cium sih nak leher, siamu ke ya pura, siamu air sus, karang mand karang lak teman. Una basronari chunchi manali yakuma masi nyukanchi yara kontaminau chininchi chi nyukanchi andia unara nyukanchi cha aicha wa unara nya angsa angsa nya chinga chushkanchi Hari chi chi parti nipis cha yakumanda askara wakli chinoshka tare terara chi tanganesha rumi unara yakumanda Makinau na siya musha. Chita lukchik makinau na tulasha, tulasha, tulasha on chinos. Si yo fuera pez, no viviría aquí. Porque el agua está muy sucia. Mana lichirikulim. Lumpa siya pa chan. Basura. Basura ya pa chan. May kambiga. May kambiga ko yar may dikpi. Mana lichirikulim. Sikshin. 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 Mana lis lagi ni? Naruna la ni tapa dia tapa dia jangan mui cayma. Mai tak seruna la aska caymanu. Kaya punya nama. Najar agus tu ada kuri tanya kamu nani. Nyuka wawona nyuka curiuna. Inya skai rikonoucho nyukanci imah nak kuya skar. Wajah tiap punya nama. Tanya aku ama. Wajah lis ke tu kucu. Wajah inya wawona tanya aku ra askar mestinya rano. Nyu kanchi raun nyu raun nyu nai cari ayer ingat raun cian dia war mira. Shu yak tau na, ayer ingat shu nish, mai nish shu yak tau nai atu yak tau nai, ayer nunggu cari, an dia war minis kara. Kayong gota yak tay, nyu kanchi cara mat kau cian dia war mira. 